questions? So this is a distributed file system as a service offering. So there is a metadata portion and a data portion to it. And George will explain all of this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to very simply create a file space. I have to log into the web portal. All right. There we go. So I have one I created earlier. It's just called filespace.demo. There is a client piece of software. You can see here that I would be asked to download it. Um, well, we're not going to worry about that right now. I've already done that. And that runs on all sorts of things. Uh, we talked about that a moment ago. I will bring my own storage. We do offer the ability for you to use the storage that we have as a lower tier for people that have really small data sets that don't want to bring their own storage. But that is actually in partnership with Wasabi. The reason we did that is simply some people come in on it, oh, I need 200 gigs or a terabyte of data for something small. Um, there's no point in buying an object storage array or going to some big cloud provider for that, not all the time. Um, all right, so I will call this file space cloud field day. This is also the, uh, effectively the single namespace that we use. You can see that we have a whole bunch of different object storage providers that we have sort of certified already. And when, what I mean is that we actually do performance testing because not all object storage is created equal and not all of it is going to be equally fast. And so if you have a local object storage deployment, that also means that maybe you need a certain amount of nodes for that to work the right way. Um, but I'm going to pick AWS today just for the sake of the demo. I will pick Northern California and I will hit next. And you can see here that I can just hit create. And now what happens is on the back end, this service starts spinning up and then I can talk to it with the client. I'm going to actually connect to one I already created before. Um, let me go here. And um, I can connect to it effectively by entering filespace.demo, right, and then the username and the password. Now, I did want to show you, let me just go back and see. I did want to show you one other thing. The key of splitting these two things here, the web portal and the application, is that you actually on the user end, you end enter your password the first time. That encryption password that gets set never ends up in our web portal. So the data and the metadata get encrypted from the client side in such a way that we have no way of knowing what it is. Um, and, and that's effectively what's being spun up here. The other thing is it's really easy to use. So as you saw, it took about four clicks to create the file space. There really is very little other infrastructure involved except for the download that I already had, which is just a binary. You can go try it yourself if you want to, lucidlink.com slash sign up, and pretty much you can go there. And so, now we're going to talk, yes. uh, talk about key management in your session or? Sure. Yeah. I'll cover that. Okay. Yeah. And then when you say there's not much infrastructure, you're, you are spinning up something in AWS. Yes. There's yes. like a yes, virtual are. machine or something. Right. We're spinning up effectively what would well, run on a container. We're setting yeah. up a container in Kubernetes. Okay. Yeah. Well, what mm. does the user pay for? Does the user have to pay for that resource that's being spun up, or do they just pay for your service? Or do they pay for both? It's no, a they pay capacity model. But they pay for our that's service, what right? They don't okay. directly pay for that right. resource. Right. So okay. That's included right. as part of our service. Okay. Like we said, we this is a file system as offered as a service. Okay. Right? You mentioned being able to use your own S3 compliant object storage yeah. on premises. Correct. What do you need to have in place so that the SaaS offering can reach that storage? You need to open it up to for internet access. Uh, port 443, that's it. Yeah. Open up yeah. for inbound 443? If you want access from the outside, yes. If you don't care about access outside, you know, the organization perimeter, then you can, yeah, you don't have to do that. Um, Wait, well, that's not true. No, you are going to have to open it up. I'm sorry, because our service needs access to the object storage. To do garbage collection yeah. and the snapshot versioning, mm -hmm. that's hand handled centrally. Right. And mm -hmm. that's on purpose, because if you have a whole bunch of clients connected at the same time, and you want to make sure that the snapshots are created in such a fashion that they're consistent and everything, it may be that nobody's logged in at that moment. So the snapshot has to be made from a central location. Now, in certain cases, we make exceptions to the service model. The service model, as you saw, is pretty easy because you click next and it's done. Right. But if somebody else wants to host these containers on their infrastructure and it's a dark site, Obviously, we aren't going to refuse that, but we will explain how much more work it is to keep everything up to date because we release new features every two weeks or so. Right. And this gives you new features dynamically as you continue going with us. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that kind of magic. You would then end up having to update the service at a specific cadence mm -hmm. to keep you know, in tandem with that. 
But, yeah, but it's not just dark sites that no, wouldn't be no, open no, no, no. to no, that's routing 443 right. internal to sure. their storage. We have customers <laughs> who run the service on premise. Absolutely. Okay? So okay. we allow for that deployment scenario. Yeah. Right. I'm just thinking about, yeah, I would have to give my storage array that has the object storage a public IP address and then allow 443. So sure. either I need to lock it down to whatever IP addresses you're using, right. mm -hmm. or I have to open that up to everybody and just hope That's that the scary. security on my yeah. Or a range of IPs. Is good enough or, to yeah. handle that. So you could do maybe some, it is, maybe it isn't. You could do some IP, IP filtering. You could probably just pick our block and, and do that. But yeah, definitely there's people that do that. So. Okay. There, there are additional layers of protection that you get through our service. So first of all, obviously you're going to use HTTPS. That's what we use, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there is access in... in you know, access keys, right, mm -hmm. to get in. Then all the data is itself encrypted, so that's another layer of protection. So if, even in, if somebody were to gain access and can see the actual objects, all these objects are going to be encrypted. And I'll talk about that too, right? So, right. so can you go back to an earlier question? Sure. So you picked out AWS as your object store. So I'm going to have your software as a service or you know, on-prem, whatever it happens to be, plus AWS, so I have the two two different bills, correct? Because it sounded like you said that it was kind of one, built can in as one. Can go back to that step? Can I, can I answer this question later? Because yeah. I really have slides that go into excruciating detail covering that. So okay. let's finish the demo, and uh, I, okay. I will answer your question. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking forward to this. Yes. <laughs> Especially this, who's trying to answer a lot of questions. I'm sure. <laughs> I'll get grilled. Yeah. Yeah. That was my job to prompt the questions. Now you yeah. handle them. You did a great job, obviously, because yeah. everybody has questions. Well, right? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I had the key stored in here earlier, but we went and jumped back and forth a little bit, so I'm just going to copy and paste it real quick. Uh, you see over here that I can enter my access key and secret key, and then I hit next. And then when I do that, you'll see that I am being requested for a root password. And now it says this in bright orange, but it's kind of small. Some people don't realize, and people, if they don't read all the instructions to the end of the wizard, they go, okay, so this is just a root password. It's not, it's um, an encryption key that tra traverses all the way down to individual files and objects, and George will explain how that works. But this password, if you forget it, I can't help you, right? Have you considered changing the word root password to this is a really important encryption key. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. um, we and actually had a it, misnomer here. We had yeah. it worded differently before this version, so yeah, we probably will change it back. Yeah. The the thing with this is is we actually encrypt the metadata and the data. All the other users get created by the root user. Mm -hmm. The root user is able to create snapshots as well, and that happens on a schedule. So you don't even have to do anything. Well, that all makes sense. I'm just yeah, no, on the name. That's all. No, no, no. Totally. All the rest of that, that sounds yeah, really perfect. good. Perfect. I was just going to continue my story. Can uh, I also <laughs> ask? Can I also ask? Um, why are you just using access and uh, secret keys? Why not using roles, for example? Because so we would do that, but remember, we don't just support AWS and IAM. Yeah. We also support all the other people that don't necessarily have them. Yes, but then you can have different other mechanisms, whatever is suitable for that particular cloud. I'm just saying that it's. We Something can, that is not good practice, is it? Yeah. Well, well, we can fine tune the solution for AWS specifically, uh, but again, we're trying to, you know, keep the system as universal as possible, right? Um, and so that is the authentication mechanism that is provided by all object storage providers, the V4, right. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And, okay. and you can you can tune the account with the secret access keys for for just storage access too. Right. And what I mean is that you know typically uh, uh, compliance reasons um, there are you know the uh, compliant organizations have to change keys yeah, all key, the time. Yeah, key rotation, key rotation. Uh, we support rotation that. Has to no, be we there can rekey. Kind of we can thing. rekey live. No we can do live rekey. Because oh. okay. we, we, yeah, we had that issue with that. a customer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, the government customer. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you can use external KMSs. The customer can provide their own KMS, and you can use their keys. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's continue. So I can hit initialize, and when I hit initialize, then your fast base gets created, which takes almost no time because I'm just initializing the metadata database the first time, and then it'll show up as a drive letter. And now I'll switch to the one I created before, like I said I was going to do, and um, we will. Very quickly, just go through the user creation kind of process and how we access it on different machines. 
Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time to discuss all the other questions that have come up during the demo. So, all right. So effectively I have a file space with two folders in here for user one and user two, just very briefly to show how that segments. We support NTFS permissions as well. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna be using them in this demo because I also have OS X and Linux, so I mean, stretching that over is probably too much of a, of a thing for this demo. Let's um, see, so over here under documents, I have a few PDFs. Let me create a new document. I'll just create a rich text document. Some new document. I'm not very creative. And we'll put something in this document and Typing and talking at the same time is not my strength. So, Windows. So this is from Windows. Now we will save this, right? Just for fun, I will also take a snapshot. As I said, this normally happens on a schedule, but you know, the scheduler isn't gonna know exactly when I just did that. So to, to make the demo easier, we're going to do it this way. Now I'm gonna log into Linux. Do exactly the same thing. So we'll talk to, and this file space could be huge, right? Um, and you can access all your data the same way. Let me go in here. And I'll do a little bit more of an exciting thing after this. This is not as interesting as what is coming next. So let's see. So I have this users view, right? And this shared folder view. And now instead of maybe editing the document, let me actually go and close this again and show you what happens if I log in as an individual user. So you can see that over here I have this panel that I can do things like create new users. If I enter this password here, I can very quickly create a new user if I wanted to. And this user would be associated with different shares. So user one is associated with share, the shared project and with user one, the user one folder. So let me very quickly just disconnect from it and log in as user one. So we'll do this and then user one and then we'll type in our password and we'll connect again. And now it uses Fuse on, on Linux and Mac, so you probably recognize some of that. And you see how the view changes drastically. I don't have access to half as much. Let me keep going. Let me continue with this document that we created. So we will now put something more in this document. And this is from Mac OS. And then I will hit. Oh, that looks like Mint. Well, yeah, that is Mint. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to sneak one by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is mint. Thank you. And then let's do it on the Mac, shall we? That's where my mind was headed anyways. So I'll create a snapshot and we'll just keep going on the Mac. And we will use user two. And we will use our password here. So I think you get the idea now. I'm gonna open this up again and I will look for that document again and we can now add something more to it. After that, I'll create the final snapshot. And we will hit save. Now we will leave that alone. We create one more snapshot. And now I'm gonna delete the file, of course, and I'll show you what happens after that, and I'll just very quickly show you how snapshots work. And after that, we will go and do the more exciting demo, and just to show you that this isn't just a file kind of sync and share solution, that we're really doing something with blocks underneath, and that we're only streaming the bits that we need to access. We're going for the slightly more um, sophisticated thing like booting a VM. Granted. As we already discussed, this is not necessarily for production use, as people are using this to store backups and for recovery purposes, right? That's where this comes up. So I'm gonna, very quickly, I deleted the file. I'm going to mount the snapshots, and I need to click the right place. Let's do that here. And then we will see the versions that we created. So let me have a look at that. And then we'll sit, switch systems after that. So, there we go. So now a different mount point shows up here with the different snapshots from the times that we created them. And over here under shared, I have the document in its state at the beginning of when I started. Hmm. All right, let me uh, switch machines here. So what I've been doing is so far I've been accessing an S3 bucket in California from a system in, in Germany. 
Right now I am changing that. Right now I have a bucket in EU Central 1. The system is also in Germany, but they're about 160 kilometers apart. 143. Uh, something like that. And this is a um, relative, these are VHD files. And um, this is a 12 gig and this is a, I mean obviously they could be bigger, it doesn't matter. The OS only needs a certain amount to start. And that's all we're gonna load. So this is sitting on top of a LucidLink mount point. I'm gonna start the task manager just so you can see that as we do this, the data transfer does change. And the screen is a little smaller than the one I normally use. So we will just squish the windows together. I'm gonna to hit start. And then you'll see that the bandwidth usage increases. So now we're booting a VM off of S3 object storage. The Hyper-V server is in a data center on bare metal, and we're in Frankfurt, 143 kilometers away with the machine, with the actual VM. Yeah. Right. So we've, we've done this with 100 VMs before, of course, you know, just for fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it works pretty well. When people see this the first time, they usually go, what did you just do? What's the uh, bandwidth between? It's a gigabit. Gigabit. Yeah. And gigabit what? Uh, the gig gigabit uh, fiber, gigabit land. This is just all internet. All of all it. There's the nothing internet. special about it. No direct. No, nothing no, no. Direct. It's not direct. It's just internet connection. Uh, this is a cloud provider, um, Hetzner, and this is just AWS. It's not anything special. Yeah. So, <laughs> a bunch of questions. But sure. we'll, we'll, we'll wait for it. We'll, I think we'll, I'm we'll, we'll let the demo. We'll let the, the demo run. Part, yeah. Well, while you guys set that part up, yeah. clearly there's a Windows agent component you load on there. Yeah. Mac support, Linux yeah. support, yeah. Um, mobile support. Mobile support, we will discuss all these things in a minute. But okay. yes, mobile support is a possibility. We, we don't actually have that on our website right now, but the code base does build internally every time we release a new version. So at some point, we may do that. Are... We are finding a lot of people are focused on a lot of NAS and file related workloads. Mm -hmm. And so we just you know have to prioritize certain features at specific oh, times. But sometimes the answer is absolutely no, no mobile, no iOS, no, no Android. No. But if the answer is maybe, no. yes. that, that's a, the answer a big is capability. more complicated. Um, our internal code base runs and compiles on iOS and Android, but we don't have the applications. We haven't mm -hmm. released it. We just don't have the engineering capacity to do that. Sure. But the code base does compile on all these platforms. Windows Phone? I'm kidding. I'm just keeping <laughs> it. Windows Phone? <laughs> <laughs>